The crushing brutality of the cross gave way to dumbfounding bewilderment. Jesus was dead. Then, three days later, he showed up. After Jesus ascended, the Holy Spirit poured out on the early church and began his journey across the oceans and across the millennia to collide with you as you sit in this room today. The gospel crossed mountains. The gospel crossed cultures. The gospel crossed hills, valleys, and what you do when you leave this theater carries the story further. The book of Acts began on the other side of the mountains to our east. It continues in your heart, and its next chapter begins on the sidewalk outside. This is the book of Acts. What would your final words be? If you knew that you had the opportunity to say one last message to the people with whom you work, with your family members, with the people of the city of Seattle, the city of Bellevue, of Renton, Issaquah, Kent, Kennedale, wherever it is that you live and work, would you share the gospel with all of your muster, with all of your passion? And have you come to a place wherein you would be willing, if called upon, to give your life for the cause of the gospel? There are people who give their lives for causes all the time. There were kamikaze pilots who were convinced they were protected by divine wind, thinking that they were guaranteed victory, sacrificing their lives and their planes and crashing upon our aircraft carriers. And all the while, in the end, what they would end with was defeat. People have given their lives before. If you're not giving your life to some sort of cause, you're giving it to something else. If you're, if you're not deliberately giving your life to a cause that is named, such as the gospel of Jesus Christ, then it's going to something else. It's going to worldly pleasures, the accruing of worldly accolades and wealth. It's going to yourself. It's hedonistic by default. You're giving your life for something. Now, would you be willing to give your life for the cause of the gospel? Now, this is not going to be an invitation unto martyrdom. The truth is that that calling applies to about 0.01% of Christians ever. But if you're willing to give your life for the cause of the gospel, then suddenly bringing up the gospel to your coworker seems like way less of a big deal, doesn't it? This is Paul moving his way back around the Aegean Sea. Sorry, from your perspective, <laughs> moving his way back around the Aegean Sea and across the Mediterranean, he's heading back toward Jerusalem. So this opening verses of today's passage, we're in Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 13. It moves in reverse order where we've come down around the Aegean Sea and visited Corinth. And now we're working our way back up. You're passing multiple wonders of the ancient world in this text. And in the curriculum that is written specifically to follow this passage. I, I, I pour my guts into the Bible study curriculum for our groups. So if you're not in a group, join one. If you want to start one, come to our small group leader, prospective leader meeting. This is, this is going to take us through the ancient world. We've already been to the temple of Artemis where a riot broke out. And now you're going to see another ancient uh, wonder of the world. You're going to pass by the Colossus of Rhodes. It's remarkable to see all these signposts of the ancient world verified ar archaeologically in the historical world. We're in Acts chapter 20. We're going to begin in verse 13. Watch Paul give one last message. What would you say with your last words before you're going to eventually face your death? This is Paul in exactly that scenario. We went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Assos where we were going to take Paul on board because these were his instructions since he himself was going by land. This was a small peninsula. The ship had longer to go than Paul did. Paul luckily had people with him who weren't cleared to go on that ship. And so he's ministering to some of the believers who, who were with him, perhaps in Troas. And he's continuing to minister to them as he walks to meet the ship at the next port. When he met us by Assos, we took him on board and went to Mytilene, sailing from there. The next day we arrived at Chios. Now, Chios is the home of the poet Homer. All right, that you, you know about this. You've learned about Homer. This is, you're, gonna, you're gonna see the biblical world overlap with what you already know about the historical world. It's fascinating. The following day, we crossed over to Samos. Samos was the birthplace of Pythagoras. Do you remember the Pythagorean theorem from algebra? Seventh grade, A squared plus B squared equals 
Yes, you know this. You already know these. This is, that, that's Pythagoras. He was from Samos. And the day after we came to Miletus, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia because he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem, if possible, for the day of Pentecost. Pentecost was 50 days after the Passover. There were some Jews who would mig- uh, migrate long ways to arrive in Jerusalem for the Passover, and then rather than going all the way back home and then coming back again, they would just stay in Jerusalem for the entire time. Paul was in a hurry. He wanted to come back to Jerusalem by Pentecost. If you'd recall, this whole thing kind of started at Passover, and we saw the Holy Spirit pour out at Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, the beginning of this book, we see the Holy Spirit pour out upon a multinational crowd of Jewish believers all gathered together in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost, and then they miraculously, by the gift of tongues, which enabled them to both speak in languages they didn't know, and hear, this is crucial, hear and understand language from other people who didn't know their language. As a result, this outpouring of the gift of tongues at Pentecost served a pragmatic purpose. Now there were Jews from every extant language and dialect of Hebrew with a gospel presentation who went home with some shocking news for their synagogues. We have the Messiah. We have Messiah. Now we can see that we've come full circle. It's back to Pentecost time again. Here's verse 17. Here is his address to the Ephesian elders. Remember that he planted this church. He ministered to these believers in Ephesus. These were Gentiles. The Jewish believers, the Jewish elders in Jerusalem as, you, as you've seen in the text, if you've been following with our, with our devotions, raise your hand if you're, if you're listening to or watching our devotions regularly. All right, if you're not, you're missing a huge chunk of the text. Okay, go to our website, subscribe if you have to, so you get these updates because you're missing huge portions of the text. We've seen the Jewish elders, in, uh, formerly Jewish elders in Jerusalem, really get fixated on these recommendations that they give to the churches. And we, they, they accuse Paul of leading people to abandon Moses. You can hear the kind of the hurtful connotation there. You can also hear that they recommend people abstain from blood and meat that is obtained through certain means. They tell people to abstain from sexual morality, that's good. But those same recommendations initially given out of preference while received well, and while initially bearing fruit in the later epistles would soon become a stumbling block because people would cling to those mere personal convictions of the Jerusalem elders and they would live, they would lead to legalism. And it would lead to this whole dispute that Paul would have to write and settle, especially regarding meat that had been sacrificed to an idol. Some pagan in the town makes a meat offering on an altar, and then it's just sitting there, this beautiful, delicious, seared steak. Like, what are we doing with this thing? I mean, the the, the God that it's being sacrificed to doesn't exist. I will eat that steak to the glory of God. But then somebody else would say, no, 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 I can't have that meat because it's it's stained with, I don't know, like demon stuff. I I, I don't want to eat it. And there's this dispute that breaks out. And Paul, Paul writes to diffuse the tension wherein they're arguing over something that's not gospel centered. And he says like, look, if your personal convictions tell you not to eat the delicious tomahawk ribeye that's just been laid on the altar of Horus, then don't. But if your conscience does, eat up to the glory of God. And so Paul is going to have to use his own voice inspired by the Holy Spirit to settle a dispute that would come because of the Jerusalem elders' recommendations. The Ephesian elders, however, have their own culture and it's very different. They're, they're newer believers. They're new to all this. They're from Ephesus. Some of them likely were worshiping Artemis not long ago. One of the ancient wonders of the world was the temple to Artemis in the heart of Ephesus. The gospel was economically disruptive because silversmiths had a huge business going making these idols to Artemis. And as people would worship Artemis, some of that involved sleeping with temple prostitutes, but also it involved the purchasing of idols. And so there's this huge riot that is incited in chapter 19, wherein people point out Paul and say he is threatening the well-being of our beloved temple and he is destroying our business model. And so Paul is in the midst of this two hour long ancient world virtue signaling fest, where people who the text says, most of whom didn't even know why they were gathered there, all end up shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Some of these elders from the church at Ephesus likely were formerly worshipers of Artemis. Now they're worshipers of the true God. And this is a council of pastors, overseers, 
elders. Those are all interchangeable and right translations of the same original Greek term. These are the Ephesian elders. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and summoned the elders of the church. Miletus is just a few miles south of Ephesus, so he just has the elders come and meet him. Elder retreat down in Miletus. When they came to him, he said to them, you know from the first day I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility, with tears, and during trials that came to me through the plots of the Jews. You know that I did not avoid proclaiming to you anything that was profitable, or from teaching you publicly and from house to house. I testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus. And now I am on my way to Jerusalem, compelled by the Spirit, not knowing what I will encounter there, except that in every town, the Holy Spirit warns me that chains and afflictions are waiting for me. But I consider my life of no value to myself. My purpose is to finish my course and the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. Let's talk about this because it's profound. In the opening portion of his address to the Ephesian elders, he's gonna establish credibility. He's gonna remind them of some of the things that he has done for them, establishing rapport, reminding them of rapport because what he has to say toward the end is gonna be kind of confrontational. What he, says, what, he says before, what he says before he's done could be a little bit painful to hear. And so he's establishing rapport, reminding them of all the things that they've been through, all the stuff that he's done for them, all the ways in which he has served and blessed them. And in it, we see a standard that's gonna be echoed in what we call the pastoral epistles. So this is, this is actually the first time we've seen in the book of Acts, Paul addressing a crowd of believers. We've seen him address Jewish believers, We've seen them address Gentile believers. When he addresses the Jewish believers, he would draw upon their shared understanding of messianic prophecy or the line of David. And he would talk about their love for the law. When he met, when he met with Gentile believers, that means non-Jewish believers, he would even begin with their altar that was built to an unknown God. When we get to our apologetic series, you'll see more of this, where he finds that, that kernel of truth and what they believe and then builds a bridge from that to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not affirming their pagan belief, but recognizing what is accurate. You built this altar to a God you don't know. And guess what? You're right. That's correct. You did miss a God. In fact, he's the only God and he is Yahweh. And so he builds this bridge from that altar all the way to the gospel, ending up with a call to repent. Now he's speaking to believers and he's establishing rapport from the onset. You know, verse 20, that I did not avoid proclaiming to you anything that was profitable. Notice that, he, notice that he uses the term profitable, something that would yield a good return in you. If a pastor is unwilling to say what is unpopular, though profitable, he's not worth his salt. This is a standard for pastors. It's set by Paul. Whatever is profitable, if you need to hear it, even if you don't want to hear it, this is what is profitable. This is what is good. I didn't, he says, I didn't abstain, I didn't avoid proclaiming to you anything that was profitable and to, from teaching you publicly and from house to house. Publicly and from house to house. We gather here, and this is public proclamation of scripture. And then on Thursday evenings, the students come to my house and we gather and we play spike ball, we ride skateboards, play basketball. Uh, we taught a bunch of Eastern European teenagers how to play baseball this week. Now they're second generation American and, that, and it, evidently it's in their blood now because they're very good at baseball. And, and we, we gather around the fire and we dive into the scripture and we discuss it in depth and we pray. This coming September, there are some changes coming within our student ministry as we continue to grow, we're gonna have separate Bible studies for middle school and high school. So both middle schoolers and high schoolers will come to my house. I'll teach middle schoolers. We'll combine for worship where we sing worship songs together and then we'll have separate high school Bible study. So that's coming in September, stay tuned. I'm doing some recruiting. And if you check the student ministry box in the connect card, I'm coming for you. So we gather here publicly, but we also meet in homes. If you're not a part of a small group, you're not at least looking at the curriculum that is posted on the website when you click member guide 
Or, or if you want to see the answers that I give to myself and to the leader's leader guide, <laughs> this is our house to house gathering. The passages that I preach on stop at a certain verse. That is the first verse of the curriculum. Okay, two sessions from now, I'm going to skip a little bit, but we'll make sure that we cover all of those verses and devotions. We go from sermon text to curriculum text to devotion text, and all of these combine to make a verse-by-verse -verse plan through the Bible. I wanted to integrate our house-to-house -house proclamation with our public proclamation. Because when I grew up as a kid, you know, I, I, in youth group at my church, I may have bought myself a devotional book at the Lifeway Christian Store back when those existed. And, and I, would, I would go through this personal devotion, but it had nothing to do with what I was studying in church. Like I would get to church and my parents would go to their Sunday school class and I would go to my Sunday school class. I had no idea what my parents were studying and they had no idea what I was studying and it had nothing to do with my devotional book. And then we would all gather together in corporate worship for the public proclamation. And then what we heard in the public proclamation had nothing to do with what we just heard in my Sunday school and nothing to do with what my parents heard in their Sunday school and nothing to do with what I was studying in my devotional and my dad was studying in his devotional. My mom was studying in her devotional. And so at the Redemption Church, I want to align everything that we do around a book by book plan through all of God's inspired word where we proclaim scripture publicly here and then house to house, we pick up often on the very next verse. This is, this is how proclamation worked in Paul's context and it's exactly how we have arranged the Redemption Church, look at verse 21. I testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance toward God and faith on our Lord Jesus. I think that's a beautifully profound summary of the mission of the church. Repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus. You notice that it's repentance toward. To repent is to turn around to turn back around and take a different course of action. And to repent towards God means you were going away from God and you repent and you come back to him. Does that describe anybody's heart right now? Can you be reminded of the beautiful mission of the church? I can think of no better application of this text than for you to do exactly what Paul says to repent toward God. You've been going away from him. You've let your sin get the best of you and you've gone down a rabbit hole. It's taken you farther than you ever thought you would go. Would you repent toward God? Would you come back home again? His grace is new every morning. Repent toward God. Have faith in our Lord Jesus. This is the mission of the church. And this is exactly, this is exactly what Paul exhorted the Ephesian elders to do. In verse 21, he said, now I'm on my way to Jerusalem, compelled by the spirit. Now this is profound because you're gonna see some debate come up as to what the spirit's will is for Paul. In chapter 19, we've seen it. In chapter 20, you're going to see it. And then it's going to come up in our curriculum this week that the Spirit has warned Paul, you're going to die. There are chains in your future. You're going to be arrested in Rome. He'd actually be arrested twice, but he couldn't know that at this time. And eventually he will be put to death. Eventually he will be, historical, historical tradition maintains, beheaded but not until he has stayed on house arrest for two years. That's how the book of Acts ends. Sorry if I just spoiled it for you. But he's going to be arrested. He's going to go through a legal rigmarole that is epic. These are some of the closing chapters of Acts. He's even going to be shipwrecked in route. And he doesn't know it yet. As of chapter 20, he doesn't know about the shipwreck. He doesn't know about the legal troubles per se. He just knows about chains and he knows that he's going to give his life for the gospel. And so he knows this is his last chance to speak to these Ephesian elders. These are his last words to them. The spirit has laid it on his heart that that's his future. That's God's will for him. Where do we get the idea that God's will always equals prosperity? always equals health, always equals improvement. Have you ever, have you ever discovered this? I, I, well, a skeptical friend of mine who grew up in the church, loved his youth pastor, but his youth pastor went away and then he got another youth pastor and that youth pastor went away and had another youth pastor and that youth pastor went away. So eventually he just went away too. And he's like, I find it remarkable that it's always God's will that my youth pastors leave me to go to a bigger church for more pay in a cooler city. Why is that always God's will? Sometimes it's not God's will. Don't conflate God's will for the American dream because they can be different things. It may be God's will that you prosper. Absolutely, I hope so. But if it's not, I praise God nonetheless. 
This is your course. This is what you have been called to run. Don't pay attention to the Facebook friend that you haven't talked to since high school who's convinced that she knows exactly where the coronavirus came from when she sits out on the deck of her third yacht, even though she was the dumb kid in class. Don't get envious. Don't covet that. You don't know what she's faced. You don't know what has been in her life. You don't know what her course is. This is your course. This is what you have been called to run. And this is what Paul echoes. This is my course. I have been called to fulfill my course of ministry. This is his calling. He knows that he knows that something's up there. He knows that he knows, he knows that there are chains in his future. He doesn't know exactly what it is. It won't be until the next chapter where a prophet named Agabus is going to show up and through dramatic illustration, show him exactly what awaits him. There were prophets of old who would use profound illustrations, sometimes shocking illustrations to make their points. Ezekiel would do this perhaps more shockingly than anybody. And this prophet Agabus shows up in the next chapter covered by your curriculum he likewise has this dramatic demonstration of a prophetic word over exactly what's going to happen to Paul. But he hasn't met Agabus yet. He doesn't yet know at this point, not knowing what I'll encounter there, except that in every town, the Holy Spirit warns me that chains and afflictions are waiting for me. Look at verse 24. But I consider my life of no value to myself. I consider my life of no value to myself. What does he mean by this? Did he just devalue his own life or quite the opposite? The key is to emphasize the word self, not value. It's not to say, I consider my life of no value. That's not what he said. I consider my life of no value to myself. Has your life been totally devoted to yourself? Would you just be brutally honest and consider it for a moment? Like I've spent the one life that I have on myself, on my own dreams and visions and goals and what is comfortable for me. I'm basically a Christian hedonist. I confess Jesus as Lord, but I live for as much pleasure and self-magnification as possible. Paul considered his life of no value to himself. It is of value, but it's a value to the kingdom of God. When we become Christian hedonists, and we devote our lives exclusively to bettering our surroundings and maximizing comfort rather than gospel impact, we lead meaningless lives ultimately. Epicureanism was one of the permutations of, of Gnosticism and an infiltrator of the church, the impetus behind the authorship of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And the Epicureans have a motto that's named in one of Paul's later writings when he would write to the very church that he planted just three chapters ago. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die was the motto and anthem of their hearts. And it sounds cool. It sounds fun. But here's the problem. Your life is pointless if that's all that you live for. You have nothing to show for your life, and it's ultimately completely unfulfilling. Just ask Solomon as he writes the book of Ecclesiastes. The man who glutted himself on the utmost that the world had to offer and found the sum of it meaningless, meaningless. All of it was meaningless. This life of Paul's was of no value to himself. It's of great value to the Lord. Your life is worth more when it is dedicated to the cause of the gospel. You could devote your whole life to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with as many people as you possibly can before you die. And regardless of what happens in your professional career, regardless of how much wealth you accumulate or even give away, you could hang your hat on a life well spent if you dedicate it, regardless of what your occupation is, to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with as many people as possible. I've been a pastor for about 15 years now, and I've yet to meet anyone who has regretted giving his or her life to Jesus Christ. And it's a fascinating thing, particularly to see somebody who is incredibly wealthy give his or her life to Christ, because if they're wealthy before and they give their lives to Christ, suddenly they know what their wealth is for. They were utterly empty before, utterly dissatisfied before. I've seen a man drive up in a Bentley Continental S. Yes, it would beat my car. Yeah, that makes me mad because it doesn't look like a sports car. But anyway, 
He comes up to meet with me in a Bentley Continental S and he's empty. He gives his life to Jesus and now he is actually full of joy. Now his wealth is about more than feathering his own nest, making his own already opulent life even more opulent, trading in his giant house for a gianter house. It's, it's about more than that. It's about feeding homeless people. It's about bringing the gospel to nations who have never heard it before. It's about seeing people delivered from addiction. It's about seeing people repent from darkness. It's about bringing gospel light to a darkened city. And now it just, the light bulb clicks on and he gets it. He knows what his wealth is for. He knows what his life is for. And he finds more gratification and purpose in sharing the gospel with people than he ever found in the business world where he dominated and was insatiable. Insatiable for a reason. He was trying to use wealth and worldly success to fill a hole that couldn't be filled. His life was of great value to himself, but it's worth more when it's placed in God's hands. Your life, the one life you have, there is no greater investment of it than to spend it reaching as many people for Jesus as you can before you die. There is no greater calling on our lives than this. What could be more important than this? What could be more important than sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with others? Paul's life was of no value to himself. It's of great value in the kingdom of God. He said, I consider my life of no value to myself. My purpose is to finish my course. You see that? My purpose is to finish my course and the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. That was Paul's course. That was Paul's purpose, to testify to the glory of God's grace. What a beautiful use of someone's life. Grace. The grace of Jesus shared with as many people as possible. I've met it's so fascinating. I was praying about, I was praying through this and I was praying about the mission field and I, 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 I saw the Lord bring multiple people even to my house in a single day who were far from God and needed to hear the gospel. Uh, I, I, I sat on my, my deck with two Mormon missionaries for over two hours and, and the, the Lord then just swapped them out. I got to bring the gospel to this, uh, the, the ladies who cut our kids' hair. My, my bride, you see, she was a missionary to an Asian country. And then when we moved here, she felt like, this is where I'm answering my calling. And we found a haircut place that has like this altar right inside the door where they make these offerings to these false gods. And then she saw that pagan altar and she was like, this is where our kids are getting their haircut. When we were interviewing a pastor in Tennessee, I was interviewing, trying to find a campus pastor, and I was interviewing a guy in Tennessee, and I, 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 I told his wife about the pagan altar inside the place where my kids get their hair cut, and, and she, was, she thought that was a bit much. That's a bit much. I've never even seen one of those before. And we could tell it probably won't work. If you, don't, if you want to live where you're surrounded by mostly Christians, then Seattle's not probably the place for you. <laughs> But the Lord in a single day gave me multiple opportunities to share the gospel with Mormons. He brought them to me. I would have offered them coffee, but I didn't want to make them stumble. And then we were getting our haircut and then she's, she's doing the haircut thing. And then the Holy Spirit was like, bring up the altar. And I was like, ah, okay, here we go. <laughs> God, I'm going to bring up the gospel to a lady that has a razor on my head right now. And I asked her, I was like, so what's the altar about? And she said it was, for, it was for cultural reasons and it's to bring good luck. And I was like, okay, what do I say next, God? And God was like, ask her if it works. <laughs> I was like, Does it work? And she said, no. <laughs> and I said, well, I've, uh, I've, got, I've got something that does work. It's the gospel of Jesus. And I would love for you to meet my incredible church, the, the Redemption Church. The, it, it, we meet in the AMC Theater in Factoria in Bellevue. She said, maybe, and she gave me a dum-dum. So pray. <laughs> 
the Lord gave, gave these various opportunities to, to share the gospel of God's grace. And I was blessed to see, I was blessed to see how God brings us those opportunities while we're here. You don't have to go on a mission trip per se. You can go on mission like by just like walking across the street in Seattle. This is the, this is the greatest investment of one's life to be a testimony of the grace of God. And this word grace is what was phenomenal, both in the Mormon context and in the Buddhist context. You don't have to come make sacrifices and offerings. This is what I said to the Mormons sitting on my deck. Like, you don't have to abstain from coffee. You don't have to wear the weird underwear. You don't have to even go on this mission. You're at my house right now because you think this saves your soul and somehow undoes your past sins. It has nothing to do with any of those. Rather, he freely saved us by his grace, not because of works of righteousness on our part, Titus 3, 5, but just because of his goodness and grace. It's because of the grace, the grace, the grace, the grace, the grace. There's nothing you could ever do to supplement the work of Christ on the cross. I said the same thing as well to my, my friends at the haircut place. You know, like this, you don't need to make these offerings. Jesus is the offering. And he, his offering is complete. This is what, one of the things that makes Christianity distinctive, this testimony of the grace of God. It's about grace, grace, grace. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. This is the testimony of Paul. This is how he, this is how he lived out his life. You see the word my course in verse 24? But I consider my life of no value to myself. My purpose is to finish my course and the ministry I receive from the Lord Jesus. You've received a different course from someone else. You may have a different ministry calling from someone else. You don't covet someone else's calling. You don't know someone else's story. Each of us has our own struggles and difficulties, but each of us has been called to finish our own course. This commitment of Paul to finish his course would be echoed in his words to his protege, Timothy. Fast forward the end of the book of Acts, Paul's imprisoned in Mamertine prison, and he's writing to his protege. And you'll see, you'll see these very words echoed in the advice that he gives his protege. Pick up in verse 25 with me. And now I know that none of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. What would your last words be? What would your last words be? Therefore, I declare to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you because I did not avoid declaring to you the whole plan of God. See, I told you it'd get a little bit confrontational there. There, I, I'm related to a late godly woman, who's lived her whole life raising her children in the church and serving in the church and testifying to the gospel of Jesus. And then it, the doctor said that it was time to call in hospice. It was time to call in the relatives. And, and, and they knew that she was beginning to fade. And, and her last words were a little bit of a letdown. Her last words were this. Go over there and stick your head in that bucket. And then she died. Is it wrong that I think that's funny? <laughs> this was her legacy. This was her last words. Would you consider for a moment like not letting your last words be a letdown? What, are the la what is the last thing that you're going to say? The last chance that you have to minister to people. The last chance that Paul had with the Ephesian elders, this was it. He knew that he was innocent, that he had proclaimed the gospel to all of them. His hands were clean. He had proclaimed the whole counsel of God. And so he could move on with a clear conscience. I proclaim the gospel to you. There's not one of you here in this council of elders of Ephesus who hasn't heard me share the gospel, so I can move on. My, my hands are clean. My conscience is clear. I've done everything that I can. Could you resign from your job today saying the same thing? Would your conscience be clear? Would your hands be clean? Would you be innocent of the blood of those who are near you in proximity to you, who respect you enough to hear what you have to say? Would you be able to say that you are innocent of the blood of everyone in proximity to you who needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ? Paul was able to say this. He had run his course. Moreover, he had proclaimed the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God. I'm gonna read from another book in the New Testament, I'm gonna ask you if you believe it. And I'm gonna warn you if, you, if you believe it, you're gonna be on the hook for something. Okay, this is, this is from 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, it says something profound. It says, all scripture is inspired by God 
and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. All scripture is inspired by God. Now again, I'm gonna ask you if you believe that's true. Now notice there's gonna be fine print if you believe it's true. Okay, so fairly warned, do you believe that this is true? Okay, then we're on the hook to go through the whole counsel of God. Not to worry, I've got it planned out. It's gonna take me about 10 years to go through the whole word of God. But this is our endeavor, this is our plan. You cannot, as he's speaking to overseers, as he's speaking to elders, you cannot believe that all scripture is inspired and deliberately omit some of it and deliberately not teach some of it. If I, if I believe that the book of Amos was written by God to the people of God, if I believe that it's divinely inspired and I don't teach it to you, I've got to answer to God for that. I'm an unfaithful courier. Okay, if you sent someone a telegram and the messenger edits your message in route and gives it to them, not only has he forsaken the recipient, but he's forsaken you. God has given us his word and all of it is inspired. And so we're gonna go book by book through the perfect, unchanging word of God. I told this to the Mormon missionaries as they showed me the Book of Mormon, which I've read and found wanting. I know that it's been edited. I know that the theology of Brigham Young has changed time and time again. I know that black people used to be unworthy of the kingdom of heaven according to Mormonism. I know that polygamy used to be required in order to be saved. I know that homosexuality used to be an abomination within Mormonism. But coincidentally, every time the 13th Amendment would come along or polygamy would be outlawed or Obergefell would be signed in 2015, coincidentally, the theology of the, Roman church, the Mormon church would change. And so I came from this right here. And I was like, this is unedited. This is Jesus's words. This is the one Lord of all. This is it. I, there need not be an addendum. Sorry, I read the story of Judas inhabited by Satan and betraying Jesus. They are not brothers, my friend. Jesus and, J Jesus and Satan are not brothers, okay? You can say that to your Mormon friends when they come to your house, offer them water, not coffee. This is the word of God. This is the truth. And there's grace here. There's grace. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. From Genesis through Malachi, I see the foundation. From Matthew through Revelation, I see the fulfillment and the promise of things to come. All scripture is inspired by God. All the whole counsel of God. This is what we're called to shepherd. Who is with me on a book by book journey through the scripture? Praise God. That's what we'll do as a church, both publicly and house to house. Exactly as Paul addressed the Ephesian elders. This, was, this is what Paul would go on to exhort his young protege with, and this is like, this is the anthem of my heart. If I can be personal for a moment, this is what I feel. This is my course. I solemnly charge you before God in Christ Jesus who is going to judge the living and the dead, and because of his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Rebuke correct and encourage with great patience and teaching. For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but will, according to their own desires, multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. They will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. But as for you, exercise self-control in everything, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So 2 Timothy 4. Fulfill your ministry. And did you hear, see this as well? Do the work of an evangelist. In our curriculum this week, you're gonna meet Philip the evangelist, one of the seven original preachers of the word who sent out. He has daughters and you're gonna to get to catch up with Philip, but now he goes by Philip the evangelist. Here in 2 Timothy 4, the pastoral epistles, it's instructed to pastors to do the work of evangelism. I've said it before and I'll say it again. If I hear one more person tell me that pastors don't evangelize, I just might start a seminary. There's a few of you I've even so spoken to about exactly that idea. You know that I mean that. Okay, if you're not going to evangelize, if you're gonna be a pastor of a church and you're not gonna share the gospel, you're not gonna do the work of an evangelist, that's okay. Just change your title from pastor to professor and change the word church on your sign to seminary and we're fine. Do the work of an evangelist is in the pastoral epistles. So I'm gonna share the gospel right now as we prepare to close. He shared the whole counsel of God 
And then look at this. Verse 28, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers. The Holy Spirit appointed them. This, this, this is a calling that comes from God. This is an irrevocable calling. It comes from the Lord. Yeah, but Jesse, what happens when a pastor messes up? What happens when a pastor sins? Well, he does this crazy thing called repent. The only disqualifier biblically, aside from those pertaining to the status of his family and marriage, is on repentance. When a pastor is unrepentant, that's when he's unqualified. Each of these has been called by the Holy Spirit, appointed as overseers to shepherd the church of God, which Jesus purchased with his own blood. Correct me when I call the redemption church my church. Because I did not purchase a church with my blood. As Paul would say in, second, in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6, he may have planted the church in Corinth, and Apollos may have watered it, but God is the one who made it grow. There's, I, I don't, don't say I go to Jesse Campbell's church, because Jesse Campbell doesn't have a church. Jesse Campbell goes to the Redemption Church. I don't have a church. It's not my church. It's the bride of Christ. It's his church. He purchased with his own blood. I have not shed my blood. I, I mean, I'll drum for you. But I haven't shed any blood for you. This is what Christ did upon the cross. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come among you, not sparing the flock. Men will rise up even from your own number and distort the truth to lure the disciples into following them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for three years, I never stopped warning each one of you with tears. And now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that I worked with my own hands to support myself and those who are with me. Like we talked about last week, Paul would make tents to subsidize his ministry. And then later on, when writing to these churches, he would insist that they establish a giving infrastructure so as to support a full-time pastor after him. But this way, the church wasn't dependent on him. He could plant the church and then move on knowing that a pastor had been appointed in his stead. Verse 35, in every way I've shown you that it is necessary to help the weak by laboring like this, speaking about those that he would also support through his tent making, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus because he said, it is more blessed to give than receive. The source of this quote by Jesus is not from the gospels. This is the one quote that we have attributed to Jesus that's not found in the gospels. But we study the gospel of John, right? Raise your hand if you remember our study in the gospel of John. In the end, in the final chapter, do you remember what John said? I suppose that all the books in all the world couldn't contain all the miracles. That he openly admits that he did not record verbatim every single thing that Jesus said ever. He records everything inspired by the Holy Spirit to preserve. And so this is one quote by Jesus that cannot be attributed to directly in any gospel. It is better to give than to receive. After he said this, he knelt down and prayed with all of them. There were many tears shed by everyone. They embraced Paul and kissed him, grieving most of all over his statement that they would never see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. And then when you gather with your small groups, house to house, you'll see the story pick up directly there, whereupon they struggle to tear themselves away, even from this heartfelt goodbye, because this is the last time they're ever gonna see Paul. And it's true. Paul would be imprisoned in Rome and then be released for a time. He would have had the chance to come back, but there's no record of him doing so. At the time, at least in the moment, he knows, as far as he knows, this is it. This is the very last time we're ever going to see each other. And so he tells them that. And these are the last words that he has to say to the elders of the church at Ephesus. What would you say? What would you say to your coworkers, to your family, if this were it? Would you picture it? It's your last day. You're getting on a ship and you're not coming back. What do you say? What have you left unsaid? Is it the gospel of Jesus Christ? Is it a word about the grace of God? Leave it not unsaid. Our gospel is worth our lives. 
But God doesn't ask our lives of us most of the time. Very, very, very few Christians are ever called upon to give their lives for the cause of the gospel. So would you be willing to endure an awkwardly social moment when you share the gospel and you get shot down? You may not be called upon to give your life, but would you be willing to at least preach the gospel, speak the gospel, share the gospel and get shot down? This is what Paul exemplified. This gospel is worth our very lives. And Redemption Church, I implore you, there is no greater use of the one life you have than to reach as many people for Jesus as you possibly can. I've never met a Christian on his or her deathbed who regretted the gospel, who regretted evangelism, who regretted sharing Jesus with others. There is no greater investment of the one life that we have than the gospel. There are people who give their lives to false religions. There are people who give their lives to selfish reasons. There are people who give their lives to false causes every day. And if you can't name what you're giving your life to, by default, you're giving it to something. Would you give the one life that you have to Jesus who gave his very life for you and see it better spent there in his kingdom for his purposes, for his ends than your own? Would you stand with us as we pray? I want to share the gospel with my lost friends and I want to call upon Christians to give their lives to Jesus. My, my skeptical friend, here's what I've been talking about this whole time. Here's what we give our lives for. Every one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us has sinned. Okay, sinner, roll call. If you've sinned before, would you raise your hand? All accounted for. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then what you get in return for what you've done, fair treatment based on what you've done is called a wage. If you work for $20 an hour, put in one hour, you're entitled to $20. That's fair treatment for what you've done. And guess what? The wages for sin is death. Fair treatment for what we've done would be death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Have you ever noticed the different words wages versus gift in that verse? Wages are what you deserve. A gift is given freely. What we deserve for our sin is death, eternity and hell apart from God. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Jesus himself said that he is the only way to be saved. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no way we can come to God the Father except through Jesus. And Romans 10, 9 sums it all up on a mountain of theology. It says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So if the Holy Spirit of God has drawn upon your heart, I want you to pray this with me right now. I want you to come down to the front and meet with our team. If you're a Christian who feels convicted by this testimony of Paul's to give the one life that you have for the gospel and nothing else. Would you come forward and pray? Pray for those in your life with whom you're going to share the gospel. Let's go before Jesus together right now. Jesus, apparently I believe in you because I'm talking to you. You've always been there. You've been that figure in the corner, that light on the hill, and I've always seen it. I've just never wanted to look because if I'm honest, God, I just, I don't want to give up these sins, but Today, I see it, your Lord. Today, your spirit is drawing on my heart. I just know you've resurrected. I know that I've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I know that the wages of that sin is death. I can't put that out of my head anymore. I believe that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. I believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I know there's no other way I can come to you, God, except through Jesus. So right here and now, filled with the Holy Spirit of God, I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Redemption Church, would you say Jesus is Lord? Say it. Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. God, let me be saved. Let me be saved. Let me be saved in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship together and come forward and receive prayer for whatever you need.